test, test, one, two, ha, uh, ha, uh, ooh, ooh, test, one, two, test, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ladies and gentlemen, test, one, two, test, test, one, two, test, test. Test, test, one, two. Test, well, good one, afternoon, two. everyone. Test, one, two. Ha. Test, test, one, two. One, two. There are a lot of seats up in the front of the test, room. Test. This test, is not one, Sunday two. Mass. You test. don't need to sit Ooh. in the back. Well, welcome to our session on changing lives and changing communities. And if anybody doesn't know, South Texas College did receive the Leah Meyer Austin Award this year. And I say hooray for us. <laughs> it's been a long journey. We have been in ATD for nine years now. So we're going to tell our story. And if you will indulge us, let us tell our story. Then we will open it up to questions. And they have specifically asked that you do go to the microphones for the questions, because the session is being recorded. So let me tell you about our panelists. Here, I'll go ahead. and. Okay, and I will introduce our panelists. I'm Shirley Reed with the privilege of serving as president of South Texas College. And Dr. Juan Mejia, on the end, wave one, is our vice president for academic affairs. And Dr. Petrosian, Dr. Petrosian, she's our assistant vice president for um, academic uh, advancement. We have, you're not sitting in the order you said you were gonna sit. Um, Mr. Paul Hernandez, who serves as Dean of our Student Support Services, Paul, and um, Mr. Sirkan Seltak, who's our Director of Institutional Research and Analytical Services, and Ms. Christina Wilson, who uh, leads our ATD core team, and I can't thank her enough for submitting uh, the nomination for South Texas College for the Leah Austin Meyer Award. I'll just give you a quick overview of what we hope to do. We can't both click, Christina. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. She knows she has a very technically challenged president. We're gonna give you a little background about South Texas College um, how we have transformed the institution through achieving the dreams and how we use those basic principles. We want to focus on our journey to create a college-going culture in our region of the state. The work we are doing to improve college readiness within our district Comprehensive advising, um, that I believe you will find of interest. We literally uh, dismantled our advising process and redesigned it. Our efforts towards college completion, and then we will have a Q&A session. I hope you can see where we're located. This is a little dark. Texas is a very big state, and we are all the way at the very bottom of the state. Frequently, you'll see on the weather map, uh, the weather in Brownsville, well, we're about 60 miles from that, right on the U.S.-Mexico border. <laughs> we call it the Texas Tropics. It's a fabulous part of our great state. 
uh, palm trees close to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, 70 degrees in the winter, a uh, great place to be. Now, as wonderful as our region of Texas is, it's not without its challenges. And our challenges may be unique compared to some of your institutions in your state. You're all familiar with the Brookings Institute. And it was about last year, they were doing a study of the top US cities, the top metro areas. And this is the headline that appeared on all of the newspapers across our region. We've always known that we were growing rapidly, we had a good economy, companies were coming down, we were always in the top 100 in terms of quality of life, cost of living, place to start a business, job creation, job growth. But we finally had to acknowledge that we were last out of the 100 top metro areas in educational attainment level. And talk about accepting some challenging data. So that dichotomy pretty well describes the challenges of our region of Texas. Very low educational attainment level. Almost 50% of our adults do not have a high school diploma and yet we have the fastest job creation rate in the state of Texas. Quite a mismatch between the economic opportunities and the skills of the workforce and the skills companies need relocating to our area. So that kind of sets the stage. But nobody can tell the story better than one of our students. You're probably aware that Achieving the Dream held a national competition called Dream Big, and it was a video uh, scholarship competition, and lo and behold, one of our own, Melissa Leone, uh, won that national competition, and we want to share with you uh, just a couple of minutes of her story, which really tells it better than I ever could. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be an actress, then a doctor, then a ballet dancer, and I finally settled on a psychologist. After high school, I enrolled in a university in Mexico, and my parents suddenly decided to move to the Rio Grande Valley, so I was only able to study psychology for one month. By January 1st, I was already living in America. Moving to another country is a very traumatic experience. All those months away from school were very frustrating and made me realize how much I wanted to study. Therefore, I enrolled in English classes as soon as I could. I enrolled in STC and everyone I met was very kind to me. All of my teachers were great at their job and really showed concern about me. I got extra tutoring every day so I could enroll in STC for fall classes and they managed to get me ready in six months. My remedial writing class teacher told me I was a very good student and encouraged me to join the honors program. I was not sure at first, but she insisted so much that I ended up joining. At the end of the semester, I was also invited to join a national honor society in psychology called Cyber. The following semesters, I received very good feedback from my teachers. They encouraged me to work hard and made me realize I have the potential to do everything I want. STC also gave me the opportunities to join the new psychology club and get research experience through Psi Beta Honor Society. Recently, I received an invitation to join Phi Thera Kappa International Honor Society, which opens up many doors for me since I want to transfer to Cornell University or UT Austin. Words cannot express how much STC has helped me reach my dream job. I dream of contributing to a field of psychology with a major discovery that changes the world. I also want to develop a mental health center to help a wide range of people. And in my free time, I want to create a ballet company because my ballerina dream is still there. 
My name is Melissa Leon, and these are the dreams that I will achieve. And that's Melissa's story. Very typical of the story of our over 31,000 students. South Texas College is a relatively new institution as far as community colleges go. Uh, next fall, we will be celebrating our 20th anniversary. Now, imagine with me for a moment a region of deep South Texas along the U.S.-Mexico border with 700,000 people residing in a two-county area without a community college. Um, it would have not happened anywhere else in this nation, but it did happen in deep South Texas. So the college was created as an economic development strategy. We had a region, I'll show you the unemployment rates in just a moment. But if you can imagine the 700,000 people without access to workforce training, without access to all the great things we do in a community college, they did have access to a neighboring university but we all know that's not for all. So we were established basically to serve as the catalyst for economic development, prosperity, and social mobility in our region. We had the wealthy and we had the laborers. We really didn't have much of a middle class when the institution was established. This is, was the unemployment situation when the college started. I don't know that there were any parts of this country that had 40% unemployment, even during the Great Depression. But this does portray the challenges we were facing when the institution was established. And just the change in unemployment rates alone show the, the kind of progress that we have made. This chart also tells the story. Um, 1993, when we began, about 1,000 students. We're now over 30,000 students and fully expect to be 42,000 students by 2020. Another piece of data that is extremely important in Texas and for deep South Texas is the fact that Texas is going to be a predominantly Hispanic population in the very near future. And if the predominant population is not well educated and prepared to go in the workforce, there are going to be some economic challenges and some real social issues within our state. So it is imperative that Texas educate its Hispanic population. But the reality is Hispanic students are not completing a degree or a credential. This isn't unique to our Hispanic students. We know this is a national challenge but 77% of the Hispanic students attend community colleges, and yet 60% of them leave without a degree or a credential. Just a couple of brags. If we had more time, we'd have a lot more brags, but um, just these three will suffice. We're ranked fourth in awarding uh, associate degrees to Hispanic students. And of the nation's 1,200 community colleges, we're ranked 44th in actually awarding, uh, bless you, <laughs> we're ranked 44th in awarding associate degrees. And in Texas, uh, where everything is big and the bigger you are, the better you are, 
um, we're classified as a very large community college, and we have the highest graduation rate of all the large institutions in Texas, and have held that honor for about three years now. So we're quite proud of those achievements. Now, how did we undertake the transformation to accomplish these things? We always had the passion, the dedication, and the commitment to student success. I would show data at every professional development activity to the faculty, and they would totally ignore me. So, they, there really wasn't a heightened concern about the impact of students not successfully completing developmental, not completing gatekeeper courses, not graduating. That's just kind of the way it was. So when Achieving the Dream came along, and with the assistance of our coaches, we were able to begin a new journey to transform that culture. And it involved really digging deep and measuring student success. Um, collecting data for decision making. And breaking down the silos. I don't know about your institutions, but we had academic affairs here and student services here and a couple of other silos. And we finally were able to dismantle those silos, restructure leadership, and the collaborative work began. Now, in Achieving the Dream, you hear several, several themes. One is about denial of the data. And one thing I've learned about this data conversation if it's data we like, we eagerly embrace it. If it's data we don't like, there is something wrong with that data. And we dealt with the data pushback, the data denial. It can't possibly be true. And it almost equated to the, the mourning process where you can't believe the data you're sad about the data. Eventually, if you deal with it long enough, you learn to just accept the reality of the data. That took us years to accomplish, and it was, I believe, one of the underpinnings for transforming the institution. The other element is what you hear is courageous conversations. You have to have some pretty tough discussions, not only with faculty, among faculty, with students, with your community leaders, with your board of trustees. They're not really pleasant conversations. Uh, we did manage to keep them civil, but they were pretty challenging. And maybe the most challenging group would be our public school partners. We had to say to them, do you realize half of your graduates coming to South Texas College need to be in developmental? Uh, they denied that data very quickly. And then they used a strategy on us, which was kind of turn the data around. And then they said, okay, so what happens to them when they come to South Texas College? And we had to say, oh, by the way, we lose half of them. So through those tough conversations and using the data, we just accepted the reality of where we were with student success. And we jointly embraced the responsibility to transform what was happening, not just at the college, but also in our public schools. We talk about a culture of excellence at South Texas College, and it truly has to be based in evidence. 
So I could tell lots of stories about how we got to where we are. Some I think I better do over a beer late this evening. <laughs> but now we're going to talk about data and how we transitioned into that data-driven culture. You're next. One of the uh, reorganizations, and um, Dr. Reed talked about dismantling things and reviewing our silos. Um, one of the reorganizations was after much talk and discussion, the uh, one shop that we had for institutional research effectiveness and assessment. And our office was called very typically OIRE. Um, but uh, one of the things that the, the college wanted to achieve is while the data-driven culture was uh, being created through these courageous discussions, um, as a natural result of that, one of the things that happened was the office would get a lot more requests for data and research and assessment support and grant support. And not only the quantity, but also the variety of the requests changed. So it really uh, went beyond a simple reporting office to meet certain accountability uh, criteria, reporting to the state, reporting to iPads, and also assisting with the grant reports. Um, and it, it was realized that we needed some specialization. Instead of having one uh, office trying to run several things at peak capacity and also at the most effective and efficient way, um, the, the idea was to reorganize this uh, big IR office into three areas that would specialize. Now, of course, there was, whenever you have a change and any structural change, there is always fear. There is fear in, these, in the department being split, in the departments being created or the units being created, and also the entire college, all the stakeholders that will be now requesting data and research assistance um, from three different offices. Um, and we, we really didn't want to create three smaller silos from one large silo. Um, and, and I think we achieved that through discussion and collaboration. We have other uh, departments and units that we continuously talk, and we actually have an umbrella what, which we call the data management team. So these three offices, uh, daily, hourly, most of the time, uh, we are in constant communication, and we're actually involved in every data-related project that is within, that lives and resides within the college. But what happens is, in certain times, one unit leads, and the other ones do their part, but we always discuss it uh, together, and I think that collaboration is uh, important. We, we discuss things from data integrity, to, uh, to grant assessment, how we can best assess and evaluate and help uh, to, to assist that grant program and so on. So these are our three areas now. We have research and analytical services, which uh, does more uh, the, the research um, side of it. If, if something needs, if, if we need to go beyond report, reporting, and have to do an, uh, an analysis if certain things work or not, uh, this is where we come in. And we have the institutional effectiveness and assessment, which, uh, of course, runs the IE uh, cycle, uh, is, plays a big part in the strategic planning process and also any kind of uh, assessment support. But we also have the student learning and the achievement, which is the learning outcomes, program and student level, course level, and also academic achievement. Um, so we, we, we brought in uh, specialists into these areas instead of one group of people trying to run everything. But we definitely did not isolate uh, anybody. We, we, these groups uh, work together as if they're one. Um, one of the products of this group was the new interactive online fact book. Actually, uh, in the morning session, we had a, a presentation and um, all of these groups work together on that with the stakeholders to transform our static PDF reporting to something more interactive and giving training uh, to the stakeholders so uh, they can play with the data and they can do some things on their own. 
And also we have uh, something that, that we are very proud of as well, which is the Jaguar Pride. That's our homegrown system. Uh, it, it, uh, it is for the program and student level outcomes database, and, and that's where the faculty enter uh, the, the outcomes and also they can get their reports. Uh, we talked about sharing the data. The data was this be, uh, is being discussed a lot more internally, but uh, Dr. Reed also mentioned about uh, our partnerships with the ISDs. Um, so we, the college started organizing what we call the summit on college readiness. This takes place every year in February, so we're actually uh, very close to it. I believe it's on the 25th. Um, that's when we bring in our other higher education partners, the four-year universities, uh, the, our public schools, and also business community leaders, so we can discuss the topics using the data, not just stories. Stories together with data, and there are uh, uh, presentations, there are panels, and there are also breakout sessions. It's a full one-day event, and there is a, a very large participation. So we can discuss the issues together instead of the two-year college discussing them, the four-year college discussing them, and the ISD is discussing them separately. And um, some of the topics that you can see on the slides, we, we, think, we talk about things like closing the achievement gaps, the college and career readiness, and, and completion. So we'll hold the uh, eighth annual summit this month, and we're, we're very excited about it. <clears throat> After sharing the data uh, at these summits, we then the action begins. We, we work with our K through 12 partners and, and start working as a team uh, to create a, a college going culture. And you, we use that term pretty broadly. Um, I don't know if you all remember a lot of the discussions during lunch, what our students were saying, how important for those students to have a purpose. Uh, early on and, and think about college early on in, in their educational career. So we created a Junior Jaguars uh, program and start working with students in the kindergarten, elementary schools. And, and really the motto, it's, it's never too early to start thinking about college. And these students are, are working with our college advisors, faculty members, they partner in, in providing uh, resources there at the, at the schools, um, and also they transform these elementary schools to, to look like colleges. They celebrate, you know, certain wings where, where this, is, um, this is the wing for, for Aggies, and this is the wing for Longhorns, and so on. So it, it becomes part of their school. It becomes part of who they are. Um, so it's important to establish these types of programs and get students thinking about college uh, as early as possible. Another initiative um, that we're very proud of is our Operation College Bound. And there's really two things that, a lot of things that I heard this morning uh, with, with our student panel is that sometimes seniors say, well, I'm not going to college because I, I haven't applied or I haven't completed my financial aid application. So this program focuses on two things, is getting that application process complete, the financial aid and the admissions process. And what we see is that in this program, we started focusing on about five high schools and, 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 and a few districts. Now we're up to 32 high schools and 14 school districts. And we're very proud of that program because we eliminate that whole concept that I'm not going to school because I haven't applied to college. <clears throat> Another successful program that we have, and, and we've done this for the past six years, we, we have a, a leadership internship program at STC. And we bring our K-12 educators uh, on our campus. It's a paid internship program. And one of the questions I ask all these educators is, do you truly believe that everyone can go to college? That's one of the key questions we asked our educators. And at the beginning of, of this training program, we'll, we'll have probably about half raising their hands. I, I believe everyone can be successful in college. The other 
uh, educators seem to see, well, maybe college is not for everyone. Um, after the three-week internship program, it's 100%. They, they have experienced our, our campuses, our programs, our support services, and, and they really have a different view of college. And we're very proud of this program because we, we give them the opportunity to spend time with our staff. Uh, we provide, we get them certified in faculty advising. Um, and these educators are, are leaders in their schools to create that college going culture. So it, it's, it's one of these programs that we've already certified our, our educational leaders, over 100 educators have gone through this program, and it continues to, to have a huge impact with our partnerships with our K through 12. The main purpose of the college, creating the college going culture is so that our students will become college ready. And one of the ways we have pursued this at South Texas College is through the dual enrollment program. Our president, our board of trustees, truly committed to this initiative and by uh, waiving tuition and uh, fees for dual enrollment students, we really grew this program. Now we are seeing the benefits of this program, how it accelerates the college um, uh, readiness of our students. At STC, we have a very large and comprehensive program. We are dealing with 21 school districts, 68 high school sites, and right now we have over 12,000 students and about 1,200 sections of dual enrollment uh, classes. Uh, it is a complex program because as you can see, we are dealing with about 300 dual enrollment high school faculty that we approve and we uh, work with, um, you know, through, through the managing the program through them, plus a hundred of our own faculty go to high school and teach some of these courses. So when you put so many entities together, you can appreciate how complex this program becomes. However, the benefits of it is truly um, um, great, uh, not only to us to help the students become college ready, but also for our community. By waiving the tuition and fees since 2003, we have calculated that we have served over 67,000 students, and collectively this has saved our families in our community over $71 million. So this is a great investment on our part with our community and for the talent in our region. The program uh, with the tuition and fee, uh, fee being waived has grown tremendously, 210% since 2004. Uh, last fall, we had 11,750 students. This spring, as of census date of yesterday, we had 12,210 students enrolled in our program. And part of it is because of our huge early college program. But um, dual enrollment has, uh, has uh, many uh, areas. The program has lots of initiative. We start from the ninth grade at-risk student, very small program, and then we go up to the very high achieving junior students. I have the picture of our web page on, on this uh, slide because we have for each of these program that I just have a heading here, we have a very detailed information of how the program works, the uh, startup, the, um, anything that you will need to know about the program and historical data is in that web page. So that should give you uh, in any of this one, if you are more interested, you should find them in our web page. Uh, again, from ninth grade, we have that very small program that we work with at risk students that we have been able to su successfully help them graduate, those that basically everybody gives up on. And then we go through that process to our high achieving uh, junior uh, level students where we have developed academies. The academies provides this opportunity to 11th and 12th grade to be able to finish their associate degree while they're at high school. We have uh, five academies, four of them is in the STEM area, computer science, uh, medical, ac medical academy, the, what's the other name, engineering, and our uh, uh, criminal justice. Now, and we also created the most unique uh, career and technical academy on the uh, welding area. That's a very new one that we have started, so that's very unique for uh, this type of programs. 
we probably have the largest early college high school system. We support 15 of them. Probably we must be the only one in the nation that has that many early college support. And we expect a couple of more that's going to be added. Um, we have about 5,000 students now enrolled as part of this program through the different uh, grades that are involved. Every summer uh, for the incoming new early college students, we have summer bridges. They go through two or three weeks when we bring the ninth graders to really let them know what they're going to be uh, involved with to get them ready for this early college process. Um, also, at the other end, we have the very successful recovery program. These are for students who are adults. Somehow they did not finish their high school, missing a couple of uh, credits or um, life happened. So uh, they now are able to come back, finish those, and also take some college credit hours and then continue with us. Since 2007, we have been able to graduate over 2,600 students through this program. It has become very well known. Uh, Jobs for the Future is working with us to replicate this and make this available for uh, the whole text. So we are very proud of that program too. We also have another one called Text Prep Program. This is a, a partnership with the San Antonio University and we are, help, we are working with seven to 10th grade students, those who are interested in engineering. It's a seven week summer program that is uh, increasing in the popularity of now. I think we have about five ISDs that we are partnering with. Overall, uh, not only we work with the dual enrollment students through the program, also the percentage of them coming to us after they graduate is increasing. We like to increase this much in a higher percentage, but right now since 2007, we had 9% increase of uh, students who then follow up and stay with us um, at the STC. Program is such a large magnitude that you always start to wonder. Our own state also start to do some studies to make sure the program quality, student success is there. We also do it internally. I didn't have that much time to show you. A lot of studies has been done that uh, helps us to, um, uh, to know that the program is successful. University of Texas Pan American is our uh, main feeder of our students. 73% of our students transfer to UTPA uh, in 2011 they did a study basically looking at the um, this um, success uh, rates of our students when they transfer to UTPA how do they do comparing the students with prior dual credit hours to those students who did not have any dual credit so the result was very um, very impressive um, as far as retention, 18% higher for those who were taking with them some dual credits with us to the university. Their GPA was almost one point higher than the native students. On the four-year graduation, 24% higher graduation rate for those with dual credits. And on six-year, about 30% higher graduation rate for those students. Uh, Program being again so uh, big and so comprehensive and involving so many entities, always communication becomes a challenge. Uh, this last year we started this uh, annual um, summit that we are going to have. We had to hold that last summer. We are going to continue to have this where we invite every one of the ISDs that uh, work with us through any of our initiatives to, to join us where we are able to share data. We provide them with their data that we have on their students at STC. Then we have discussions. Sometimes we bring in new information. And mostly the whole main purpose is that we have to maintain the quality of the program. So the whole purpose of the summit is that we are going to do everything possible that the quality will be enhanced and we will be have a very successful program for our students. Before I hand it to Dr. Mejia, I'd like to just make a, a comment that on the case management model that we have at STC, after looking at the data and, and what our developmental students were needing, they really wanted a, a different delivery, advising delivery for, for, for that student population. They looked at a case management, and I'll talk more about that later on in, in the presentation. But this was a, a very critical component in helping our, our developmental students be successful. They needed to, to have an assigned advisor. There were mandatory uh, critical uh, points of, of what I would say advisement contacts that, that must occur on that critical time. 
uh, to increase momentum and success. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Dr. Mia. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, during the first term of President Obama, he launched the American Graduation Initiative. You remember that? About community colleges. And now, Dr. Reed, I know it's an old story, but I'm going to share it really quickly. Uh, somehow, in Inside Higher Education was going to do the interview with the president. And by some fluke, they selected me to be the representative for community colleges. So I prepared super well for that interview. And I remember it was a phone interview. It was about one hour long. And I had like outstanding quotes representing us like to no end. My mom would have been super proud of it. When I hung up the phone, I swear I heard like F-15s fly over my head, like in the Super Bowl, because it was such a good interview. <laughs> Next morning, when it came out, of course, selfishly, I went to look at, at how it went. And sure enough, they're celebrating President Obama and how community colleges count. And President Obama said this, and he said that. And so I was looking for wh where, where Juan Mejia said anything. So finally, there was one little line. And it said, according to Juan Mejia, he said, it's a great day to be at a community college. <laughs> and that was the extent of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was at a meeting in Austin. And people were actually congratulating me, like, great job. That was outstanding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I myself was shocked. I said, wow. I said, you know what? I only got like 10 words in there. And my good friend, president of Lee College, Dennis Brown, said that those are 10 more words than I got. <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. But you know what? It rings loud and clear. It's a great day to be at a community college. It's a great conference. It's a great opportunity. You know the way we talk about universities being like a tanker or an aircraft carrier to turn? We're able to be nimble, creative, and energetic. And that's one of the exciting things about being at South Texas College. We actually have meetings where Dr. Reed says, what is the next crazy idea? That's kind of the theme, and so we're thinking about how we're going to do this. But this was a great opportunity to break some additional silos with the Developmental Education Initiative, and it was to partner stronger with student affairs. And I would be remiss if I didn't celebrate the partnership I had with the now president of El Paso Community College, Dr. William Serrata, my good friend and colleague, because we were able to work together on doing very innovative things all to serve students. One of them was something you've heard about already, contextualizing curriculum. The thing is, we hear about it, but have we, have we put it in place? So if you, for some reason, have not, we encourage you to go back, start those courageous conversations that President Reed referred to, those courageous decisions that need to be made so that you begin to put in place how can curriculum be contextualized. We're doing it with developmental reading, developmental English, and then integrated learning projects. You heard about Dr. Tinto talking about not just group work, but how do you make projects meaningful for students? Themes. The themes we have right now for this project with Developmental Ed Initiative, where students are enrolled in developmental education classes and co-enrolled with what has been known as a, as a, what is a gateway course, a sociology course, a history course, so that the theme for those developmental linguists, developmental, developmental reading students, are aligned with what they're going to be doing for their sociology class or their history class. In addition, I know that in other states, you're able to integrate reading and writing. In the state of Texas, that wasn't permitted. We had to teach like three levels of developmental reading, three levels of devel developmental English, and now we actually have authority to do them integrated. So it's saving to, uh, students time. It's part of acceleration. If we go to the next slide on uh, developmental mathematics, boy, that's a challenge, isn't it? Here's, a, here's what we did. As part of our crediting agency, they require that we meet all the core principles, but in addition to that, they allow us to do a project that's truly going to serve students. It's called the Quality Enhancement Plan. Our focus was on developmental mathematics. How many here have three levels of developmental math? Can I see your hands? All right, you, we were in good company. Anyone have four? OK, any, any more than four? All right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Don't, we need to bring that down. We had four once upon a time, brought it down to three. And our plan was, how do we bring it down to two levels? Now, the faculty haven't been told, but we're bringing that down to one. <laughs> so will it work, though? So here's the story. We developed our plan about bringing that three levels to two, and we found out that we were being more successful. The data continues to show that. So higher completion rates, and because it's working, one thing that our president has said is, if it works, let's not wait a couple of years to do this uh, continued assessment and assessment. Remember, we're the kind of nimble little boat that can turn around and make things happen. So we begin to do that in big scale, take to scale. And you heard presentations about how do you think something to scale. Now, careful, because even small little boats can tip over. So you want to be 
do things at the right time, work with, with the teams, have good dialogue, and make it effective. Uh, let's see where we at, Christina. We're looking at the success. This is the success of going from three levels to two levels. So right now, we are very proud of our students in our quality enhancement plan two-level courses with a 73% success rate. So that's good. Now you might be questioning, well, I wonder if they're just kind of passing them through to the academic part, but maybe that the next slide will show us. Here's our success in the college algebra as well. Now a lot of this is kind of the opportunity for collective impact. You heard about our partnership with the public schools. Therefore, we're actually getting better prepared students from the public schools because they've been participating in college readiness. We're also aligning curriculum. How many here have academic math and developmental math and they don't talk to each other? We actually had that experience that our developmental mathematics was not aligned with our academic mathematics. So the courageous conversations and courageous decisions were made so that those are aligned. Now faculty teach from developmental math, teach academic math, and vice versa, and it's helped out with that communication. I, I'm going to pass it back to Sir Khan. There is, there is one more slide uh, on uh, the, the college readiness that we want to show. Uh, this is the percentage of students enrolled in developmental coursework at any, uh, hi historically. This is not entering students, but if you take the cross-section of your students in that academic year, how many are, what per and how many and what percent are enrolled at least in one developmental coursework? Now, uh, what, what we see here is a, a couple of the things that we have discussed previously uh, having that effect. I think one of the things is dual enrollment. For students to take dual enrollment courses, um, they need to be college ready. They don't need to be college ready in all areas if they're only, for example, going to take math. But if they want to take math, they need to be math college ready. So the same criteria that applies to our uh, post high school graduation college students applies to them as well. It encourages students to be college ready early. And in fact, we refer to our dual enrollment programs as our C cube, which is thinking about going to college, the college going, and then becoming college ready early, college ready, and also completing college, not just going to college or starting college, but also college completion. Uh, the, the dual enrollment programs are growing, as you have seen, and that is trickling down as students come into our gates after high school graduations, more of them are college ready. The second thing is, if they come not college ready, whether in math or English, uh, we, we still have those students, but through acceleration, they are spending less time. Uh, there used to be students who would stay two, three years in developmental uh, studies. Now that's shrinking as well. I, I, I look at this diagram and I, I, I remember basically uh, how many people you have in the system. There are people that you will add to the system because they're not coming in college ready, and then the people that you will exit from that system, from that pipeline, and uh, basically we're decreasing the people coming in college ready uh, through dual enrollment programs, and we're also decreasing the time students who come not college ready uh, in the pipeline by reducing the time they, they stay in there. So that has shown that 45% uh, decrease in the uh, percentage of enrollment. And it has been, uh, it has not been without a challenge because at the same, at the same period of time, we also have seen a 75% increase in our enrollment. It's always good to have a, the data expert next to you. <laughs> <laughs> the next steps, where are we going with this? You heard about the two levels in our quality enhancement plan for, for, for developmental mathematics. We also did it for, of course, now we're doing it for the reading and the writing. Instead of three levels, bringing it down to two. And really, tru truly doing a lot of pre-assessment, pre-assistance to students to bring that level down to one. Next steps were a part of what you heard this morning during the session about the new Mathways project. And we're excited to be a part of that. It's, we're, it's fairly new, going to be launched in the fall. So again, uh, that's the next steps. We're part of the Puente project. Now, some of you that are part of Puente might say, well, you usually work with, with smaller groups. The N is small. But you learn so much from that. I, I won't shoot down pilots in any way. It's a way you can get data, you get buy-in, you build momentum. Non-course-based remediation 
in the state of Texas, that was something we didn't have a lot of latitude to do before, but we're doing a lot with now non-course based remediation. So the students, again, it's not about seat time, it's about mastery of content. And then the continued review of data to make decisions so that we can continue to take things to scale. <coughs> On, on comprehensive advisement, one of, let's step back to 2005, and, and I wanted to really focus on, on what the barrier studies had to say. One of the things that the barrier studies showed, the data showed, was our students were lacking information about classes and services. And our department, our division, took that to heart. We realized that academic advisement was the answer. We had to provide it uh, holistically. We had to provide it not just at the beginning of, of, of the student experience, but all through their educational career. So to address those issues, we, I think Dr. Reed was exactly right. We had to dismantle that whole program, and we had to listen to what our students were saying about our advisors, listen to how we were delivering that information to our students. And what they were saying and what the students wanted from our institution, if we were gonna be a student-centered institution, we had, to, we had to take that to heart. They wanted case management advisement. And what is case management? Case management means that a student has someone, someone that is going to not only provide the information, but to provide the information at the right time. So we looked at that that model extremely closely and we implemented that for all our first time in college students. And there were four major contacts and I'll provide more information on that. They also said they needed more advisement during these high, you know, when they had these high enrollment and high failure courses. These are your gateway courses. These are the courses that students have the most difficult time. And these are the courses that a lot of times students leave our institution because they, they feel they don't have a, a chance passing these courses. So we had to divide, develop a, a mentoring program or an advising program to address that particular population. We started with developmental math and college algebra. And we expanded that program to other areas. And today we're, we're actually back in focusing on, on academic math to get these students through. They also said mandatory orientation. And I know that many institutions, how many, how many people here have a mandatory orientation program in, and all students attend that, that orientation program? A few hands went down. Um, and the reason I, I make that point is that we're in the process of implementing a mandatory orientation program. But for us to be 100% and address all our students, it can't be one program. You have to provide several programs to meet the needs of all your students. So we'll, we'll talk more about, about that strategy. So we implemented the case management approach to our students, and in a very short period of time, we, we saw some results. Let me tell you about our four key uh, advising contacts. The initial contact, one week before classes start, an advisor must make a contact. There should be a fourth week follow-up session, a priority registration with a financial advisement component and how they're going to pay for these courses next semester. And then the final contact is a final preparation, helping students access all the resources they need to be successful during final week and get them through that course. So, we pilot this back in 2005, and the data showed that there was a higher uh, course completion rate, a higher GPA, um, and of course, a higher retention rate. And we knew at that point, we were on the right track. We still had a long way to go, but at least we knew that this was going to have an impact, and we could refine those strategies. We also looked at a faculty advising training program. This is a program we're extremely proud about, uh, about for the reason that this is not a paid uh, training program. This is a volunteer. But I want to, to let you know the reason it's so successful is because our relationship with, with instructional affairs. One of the key elements of a faculty's evaluation is 
academic advisement. Many of our faculty that have been promoted uh, have been certified in faculty advisement. And, and I can tell you this openly, I don't recruit faculty to go through this program. They come to me. They want me to be sure that there's a seat available for them to go through our certification program. This program it consists of two elements. It, it consists of the Nakata training modules, which, which is best practices. And the other half of this training is the ATD data that we provide our faculty and staff and let them know who our students are. And many faculty members would love to advise our students, but they've never been trained. And that was something that they kept on saying. Why, you know, if there was an effective training program, I would love to advise my students. I just want to be sure that I'm doing it correctly. So the next steps, when you think of scaling up our advising program, we had to bring technology in. We had to bring in an early alert system that would provide uh, information to us that these students are, may not be showing up to class or their performance in the class isn't up to par. So we needed to, to then develop that, that program that, that way we can easily respond to their needs. We needed to show a student progress dashboard for our students, letting them know where they stand in their, in their program. And that provides them that, that feedback that students need that am I on the right track. And then, of course, the off-track notifications. This is something that we're working on right now to, to let students know if they're registering for a course that's outside their degree plan, it's time to see an academic advisor. We want them to stop what they're doing. We want them to come see us and be sure that they're on, on the right track. The Beacon Mentoring Program was a program that, that was very, uh, it was looked at back in 19, I mean, 2006, 2007, and we did a lot of studies on this, on how this program is helping students get through those gateway courses. And I like to even say that our, you'll see this, this lighthouse uh, all over our campus. And, and the reason that we, we picked the lighthouse is that many of our students seems to be lost out there. Uh, and, and what we wanted to project to them, um, and, and our last vice president thought that this was a, a great uh, uh, symbol of what we do, is that we bring them back to us. We want to attract them to us and let them know to get them on the right track. And, and we've been very successful in that program. An orientation program. Um, I've heard several comments on mandatory orientation and and I've even heard comments that, you know, students don't do mandatory. Uh, they do, they, they do mandatory. What we need to do is provide them options on how they complete that requirement. Um, and I truly believe that, that we're doing a, a, a wonderful job trying to, to accommodate our students, our working students that can't spend a whole day during an orientation program, but provide a, a fast pass uh, orientation program. Just give them enough information that they need to get into the first day of class. And that's something that I think is, is critical. You can overwhelm students if you provide them too much information and, and then all of a sudden they, they can't use it. So we looked through the data what information we should be providing our students. And, and, when, and, and, and then, of course, we want them to respond to that information. There needs to be a behavior that's created from that information. Thank you. And the last subject we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today is what we have done to improve our completion rates. And I can safely say that everything that we have talked about so far have has impacted those rates, but there are some specific things that we've done um, since joining ATD um, to, to, to impact those rates. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those things. In 2006, President Reed convened a graduation task force. She saw at that point when we were really looking at our data that our graduation numbers were not where we wanted them to be. And that task force dug deep into the data, took a look at some of the barriers that are in place for students completing their degree, and several strategies came out of that. 
earlier, um, Dr. Petrosian talked about our stop out uh, student recovery program that was developed at that time. We spread um, information about advising and the information that advisors have to faculty, staff, and to students, get, the, get more information out there. We also have um, an online degree audit system. At the time, it was not used very much, so we really got some trainings going, make sure our faculty and staff started using it. Supplementary instruction was something that was on a smaller scale at that time. At that time, we, wrap, we ramped it up. And finally, we started piloting contextualized college success courses. And because of su those successful pilots, we do have courses that are offered on a regular basis. Particularly, we have seen um, tremendous success with contextualized nursing college success courses. In 2009, we started thinking, well, if what we are being judged on is how we impact a, a small number of students, we all know iPads. They look at our full-time, first-time in college students. Well, if this is what they're grading us on, why don't we develop some strategies that target just those students? We have so many strategies that impact everybody. Why don't we look at these students in particular and see if we can get our numbers up? And that's what we did. We um, developed standardized reports about those students in particular. We took a look at their degree plans, because as, as you know, that, that cohort, for us anyway, and I'm sure for a lot of you, that cohort is relatively small compared to our whole population. So we were able to look at where they are in their, in their, in their degree progress, the classes that they need next, make sure that they have those classes in order to graduate on time. We offered them more work opportunities on campus. We also started thinking about automatic graduation. So many of our students leave us before they finish um, their degree, or maybe they finish their certificate and they don't even know it because they were pursuing an associate's degree and didn't know they had finished the requirements for a certificate. Why don't we give them that certificate or that AA degree automatically? So we started thinking about that, and we also began developing our reverse transfer processes at that time. Oh, and by the, by the way, if you're looking at the top, it was really funny when we started this. People said, CSI? Crime scene investigation? No, this is our cohort success initiative. A part of that program is our GOT program. From that IPEDS group, we looked specifically at those students that were college ready, and we gave them tremendous support. We continue to give them tremendous support. These students are out automatically a part of the GOT program, and they are assigned a graduation coach, which who begins with them right when they start with us at STC and stays with them until they graduate. They have a faculty advisor for their major. There's a robust website available to them to help them through, um, through the, to, to navigate STC systems and processes. And we also try to place as many of them as possible with an on-campus uh, employment. And finally, let me tell you a little bit about Texas Completes, which is relatively new. Some of you may have heard about it already, but let me just give you a, a brief description. Texas Completes is a coalition of five community, col community colleges in Texas, South Texas College, of course, Lone Star College, Alamo Colleges, El Paso, and the Dallas Community College District. And we came together thinking, well, all of us have strengths in different areas, and we're all trying to get our students to, to get their degrees and their certificates. What if we could work together, start with a small cohort, figure out what works, and then bring in more colleges into this initiative? So right now, um, we're just getting started defining how we're going to do these things. We're putting our data together, looking closely at it, and here are the priority change areas that we have established. We want students to get through any remedial courses quickly so they can enter a program of study. We want them to know how they're doing in their classes, in their degree plan. Are they taking the right courses? Are they off track? We want them to know that. Of course, reduce the time spent in remedial coursework, and we really want to leverage heavily any electronic solutions available because as you know, um, 
that's, that's where we're going. Students like having information on their phones, their tablets. They don't necessarily want to make a face-to-face -face appointment. Let's make things as easy for students as possible. And Sir Khan's gonna tell us a little bit about the data related to those efforts, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. This is historical data on our three-year graduation rates. Um, uh, it, it, it has increased seven percentage points since 2007. Right now we're at 18.7 percent level. Again, this is the graduation rate of students who start in a fall, uh, first time in college with us, and also full time. Um, in in Texas, as Dr. Reed mentioned, we are uh, categorized as a very large college, and those are colleges that have more than 20,000 enrollment. Um, one thing that um, we, we, we add to this always is, um, as you know, every graduate counts, but not every graduate counts in these graduation rates. Um, if you started in spring, you're not in the numerator of this equation, if you started in the summer uh, as well. If you uh, came into our institution with prior credits from another one, transferred to us, and graduated with us, you're not in. If you started part-time in your uh, Fall term, you're not in, and so on. Those are the things that you know, so I, I will not uh, go over the list. Um, the other thing is due to our f the fact that we have such large dual enrollment programs, um, and, and some of them, the early colleges and the dual academies, they, have, uh, they are graduating by the time they are high school graduates also with an associate's degree, and they move on to a four-year university and they're not counted here either. So we always uh, show our also total degrees and certificates uh, to, to, to balance that. And as you see here, it, there has been a 138% increase since 2004. And if I uh, can give you a very simple perspective, we have about 2,500 full-time uh, FDIC in a fall. So the, for, the, for the previous slide, our denominator is 2,500. If we graduated all of them in three years, it would still not reach these numbers that you see here that we are currently graduating. So there are a lot of graduates out there that don't go into those graduation rates. We are improving our graduation rates and there are all these new initiatives that started since 2008-9 and it, it will take a certain time for them to take effect as well. But also we see here our uh, total uh, degrees and certificates awarded and we're very proud of them. And um, Finally, one of the things that we all do with, uh, and more and more so with Achieving the Dream, uh, we disaggregate the data, and since we are 90% uh, Hispanic, we're always, um, we always want to know if the, how the Hispanics are doing compared to the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the other uh, race and ethnicity groups, and uh, the number of associate degrees awarded to Hispanics has increased by uh, 96% since 2004, and that has increased for, uh, by 78% for all the uh, non-Hispanics. Um, so just uh, a few data points uh, after talking about those uh, completion strategies, and uh, we're very excited also to see how uh, the new, newer ones will take effect and uh, will add higher, bar higher bars to, uh, to, to the following years. And um, with that, we want to open it to Q&A. That was a lot, huh? <laughs> This presentation will be available on the ATD website, and in the presentation there are links embedded. So I know we gave you a whole lot of information. We wanted to share as much as we can. So this will be on the website, and we can also, um, you can get, give us your cards and we'll send you whatever, whatever information that you want. But the floor is open, the mic is right in the middle. Ask away, we're all here. I started to say I had a quick question. I don't, I don't know if this is a quick question, but uh, in, uh, in serving uh, this major disenfranchised population, what is the role in your student services and your overcoming barriers for the, the undocumented students? That was my question. There, there is, there's really no difference. There's really no difference. Um, we, we service students that 
as long as they uh, they show residency that they're living uh, within the district uh, those and they graduated from a high school that uh, we treat those students just like any other student uh, coming through our doors good question any other questions by uh, your reference to contextualized student success courses. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, please? And, and we have our academic dean that has been doing that. It really started with uh, the courageous conversations included faculty. And it, we had heard about the contextualization, so we brought in faculty who had been teaching developmental education, and the faculty who were teaching the academic side, the history, the sociology, and just say, here's a great opportunity We've heard about it. How can we really roll out a, 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 a positive curriculum related to it? So it was tied through a type of learning community. So it was co-enrolled students, the faculty in dialogue. One thing that we did, which was very courageous, we used to have a division for developmental education. And we were very proud of that. And, and I mean that sincerely. We were very proud that we had a dean for developmental education that oversaw that, uh, that division. But recently, although it sounded like it was a bad plan, we dismantled that division. But we integrated it into the academic side, but kept it the chairs. So there's still a chair for developmental mathematics, developmental reading, and developmental writing. The only thing is now the developmental mathematics faculty chair is in the math and science division with equal rights to have decisions. And same thing with reading and writing. So in reading and writing, in the contextualization, the chairs and the faculty are part of the academic liberal arts and social division. So there's extended communication. Um, it was uh, a good efficiency model as well and just more, more communication between them. The results have been very positive. We've also, we're also using it with our, the Puente project, which is we're using learning frameworks in combination with the academic courses and the results so far are very, very positive. I would also like to add that College success plays a critical role in, in not only uh, uh, a lot of the ATD initiatives. A lot of times we would focus on, on this student population because they were, they were new to the institution. And so I'd like to, to also mention our faculty were very open to, to uh, looking at how we could uh, bring in some key elements, uh, some data into the, the college success course to help those students transition to college. So it, it was, it was a, a powerful vehicle and it was a, a program that I thought was, was one of those departments that took the lead on, on supporting ATD. Could you just share how you were able to offer the dual enrollment program at no cost to the students? It, it can break the bank. If you hear about it, <laughs> we're going to waive tuition and fees. And we have our, our dual enrollment guru up here who was a former high school principal. But the way we started it was, we, our, thanks to our president, the board of trustees, they, we needed volume. So at that time, we were operating with a small end, small group of students. But if we're using the high school teachers who have uh, the credentials, required to teach, if we're using their facilities in, in, uh, in our accrediting agency as a master's degree or a master's, the 18 graduate hours and a master's degree. So if the, if the teachers from the public school had those credentials, we were using their facilities, their utilities, everything, then bottom line, we were just paying them a small stipend of $350 for the extra paperwork, documentation, et cetera. And in the state of, state of Texas, the funding comes through three streams. I'm sorry, it's kind of, uh, it's a for, for formula. It's the tuition that students pay, the contact hours that are generated and we get reimbursed from the state, and then the t a tax base. Uh, so we were still generating contact hours through this. We're losing out on tuition, but we have a, a model, and I think I saw Dr. Canales, Lucerma Canales here earlier, and we did a, a cost studies, extensive cost studies on all this, so when we use the, again, when we use the teacher from the public school, we have to, they have to go through our approval process, meeting with the chair, teaching presentation, then it's cost effective. If they do not have a teacher with the right, with the appropriate credentials, 
then if we have to send a teacher to do it a faculty member, then we bill them for that faculty member. So we're, we're actually, Nick, we, Nick does the cost, plus the travel, and schools are paying it because now they don't have to hire a, a, a teacher to have in their staff. They're using the, our faculty and we recover costs. We have a re, uh, cost recovery system. So if you need additional information, we have a whole manual on how this is done. But that's b the bottom line, on it, or the basics of it, excuse me. I'd like to ask about your um, college success classes. Do you just have one version, or do you have di varieties of different versions, a one credit, a three credit? Uh, and also, in orientation, it sounded like you had different variations on that to sort of customize to different populations? I'll start very, uh, very quickly with the college success. We do, we have a college success that's not credit bearing. We also have a learning framework class that is credit bearing. We have a college success for Ally Health, the students that are going to the Ally Health. So remember the contextualization that we're talking about is really putting it in place. So we have a few models and thanks to the comprehensive advisement that helps the student determine which one is going to be the one that I really need. Then Paula, you want to talk about the orientation? Yes, sir. The orientation, we, we have a first year connection uh, model uh, of orientation and we, we get about maybe 45 to 50% of our FTIC through that program. We just created a fast pass uh, orientation program and, and the fast pass is really a, a, an opportunity when you have these walk-in students that that come in and apply and for some reason because of their work schedule and so on we want to get them to our, our welcome center immediately and what that orientation is is a, is a very condensed orientation it doesn't have a lot of the social interaction it's not a, a first year experience but what it does have is those those key elements that you want the student to have at that time to help them transfer. Um, do they have their test scores? Uh, you must meet with an advisor. And, 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 and after that fast pass orientation, we do so assign that student an advisor. So they'll, that all that process that's done, uh, even in a first year connection, we've condensed it and, and try to make it a, a fast pass. We, it's not, a, it's not at the point that we want it to be, um, and, and we're going to have to expand it to, to, to more hours and so on. So if we're going to have a mandatory orientation program, it, it, uh, one size fit all will not work. And we've seen that. Uh, there's just no way. We call our students. We let them know when the event is coming. And, and we're just not getting uh, the, the turnout during our face-to-face. -face. We had a, a, a wonderful turnout um, this spring. But still, there's still a, a student population that, that would probably be uh, met, you know, with a fast pass orientation. And we do have an online orientation program also. I have two questions, really. They're, they're both short. Uh, how effective have you been in, in sharing your student achievement initiatives with your adjunct faculty? And lastly, you've gone through a tremendous amount of change. Uh, how have you dealt with change fatigue? Uh, I'll address the adjunct faculty. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed the second second question. We have a, a strong professional development program. We have new faculty academies, dual enrollment faculty academy, principal summit, uh, full time faculty. Um, just we have academies for just about every everyone and everyone ambassadors so that everyone cross training our adjunct faculty are very very much included now we we do not have we have a, a nearby regional university and I say that to point out that we don't have a large access or large amount of, of adjunct population we have our, our president has supported a strong commitment to full-time faculty so our adjunct uh, population is smaller, but they have, uh, when they sign their agreement to teach with us, the agreement says they have to attend professional development. They've got to be a part of department meetings. They've got to be evaluated just like everyone. But we also include, f get feedback from them. On how can we better serve them? What ideas they have to better serve our students? Because something that Dr. Reese started years at, when she started the college was, 
yeah, our founding president, by the way, it hasn't been mentioned, was about a common assessment so that a student, regardless of where they took that course, what modality, at what campus, is going to be assured of a quality curriculum. And that includes adjuncts. So they're integrated in, in everything. We invite them, they come on board, and we really have had no, no uh, apprehension to their participation in any way. And I'm sorry, what was the second question? I think the second question was, um, how do you address change fatigue? It just is. We do it all the time. It's woven into the culture of the institution. My staff is chuckling. We just change constantly. We spin on a dime, go in a new direction if it's not working. Very quickly on the change. Uh, sometimes, oh, to bring about change, you need new people. So there's turnover, turnover. But as I mentioned, Dr. Rita is the founding president of the college. Most of us around the table were there when the college was founded. So when you have that stability, sometimes you're able to affect very positive change. Uh, again, our, our former vice president for student affairs, we just lost him to the presidency of El Paso, but he was there since the beginning as well, and we worked together very well. I know Lydia. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the change is just part of the nature. But it is important to recognize that when guests come to the college, they do say, oh my gosh, the pace is just phenomenal here. You guys have to slow it down. And it's like we just got used to that, uh, what's, what's the next crazy idea? Mike's kind of low. Um, those graduation numbers are just amazing. Um, and I'm interested in the distribution of your graduates throughout your degree programs. And I know you probably don't have that information off the cuff. But specifically what I'm wondering about is how many graduates or what percentage of your graduates, estimated probably, graduate from an Associate of Arts degree with no specific concentration or program of study? Sir Kong, while you're, th while you're thinking about those numbers, you see the yeah, you see the 18 percent close you see the close to 19 percent and i know there could be some in the room that are saying wait a minute we have a higher graduation rate than that we recognize that without a doubt it is a number we're super proud of we're proud of the fact that we move the needle remember achieving the dream is about are you able to move that needle we were at 11 percent it could have stayed at 11 percent through all these years but we were able to move that needle and that has been very positive our projections are that we're going to be at 34% very soon. That is that aggressive kind of putting it out there? Um, now, as far as the distribution, Sir Khan, I'll pass it to you. He's got it all up here. Um, I, I, I don't know the data, but um, we have a, also a graduation. Well, we mentioned it. The graduation task force is actually reviewing the uh, uh, graduation targets the closing the gaps targets for the state of Texas as well. So um, we actually disaggregate the data and we bring the deans and the program chairs and we, we review the data to see what will be the targets for next year and the next three years. And we, we calculate their, uh, the, the rates and the number of graduates for them. I, I just don't know the rate for any specific program from the top of my head. I, I think that's a, a really good question. I, I, I think the question is, you know, when you look at these broad uh, programs that, uh, or interdisciplinary programs, um, I, I think I know where, you, where you're going. Um, are, those programs have actually shrunk on our campus. Matter of fact, our focus is trying to get them on a, on a, on a pathway, on a program, uh, instead of these broad-based programs where sometimes when they do transfer to the university, a lot of those credits somehow just don't fit how they should. So the advisement is, is a key component, is helping these students, and, and through Texas Complete, in, in getting them on a career pathway, and designing those, those degree plans where, where it is meaningful. A lot of these programs are directing them toward a particular career or program, I think is, is critical, and we're already on that path. Um, I, I think your question was if maybe our graduation rates were probably uh, this, this um, broad-based program, and, and that was able to jump those numbers. Absolutely not. Matter of fact, our interdisciplinary programs have, have actually uh, gotten smaller. 
in regard to dual credit, the, uh, do you accept dual credit students using their tax scores? And does that student subgroup factor into the 17% that we saw requiring remedial education? The, um, the, the percent in, um, the, um, in remedial, that includes the entire uh, population of enrollment, so that includes dual. Since we hold the dual students to the same criteria uh, to, of the college readiness, if, uh, as if they are our traditional students who come after the uh, graduation. So um, most of our dual programs are for uh, academic courses. So they have to be college ready in the areas that they're taking courses. And we have one, uh, the certificate uh, academy, the, the welding that Dr. Petrosian mentioned. And in those cases, they're uh, exempt. So uh, we include them in, the, in our calculations. Sorry, the first part of my question, did they, do you accept students using tax scores alone? Or do they take, or do you take tax, and then they take the placement exam as well? <laughs> we couldn't all fit up here, so we got some backup in the audience. We take them any way we can. Um, yes, uh, primarily the tax because it's free to the students, mandated by the state of Texas. They have to take it as a higher level than, uh, than it takes to graduate from high school with a tax. If you're familiar with, with that, they hit a certain level and they qualify to graduate um, in English or math with all those scores. So primarily that's the, the test that is used, but many, many students take the Occupacer, the uh, other tests, SAT, ACT, those, those also qualify them. In particular, the early college high schools because the tax is not in the ninth grade, and so we uh, have them take the Occupacer and the Thea to qualify. Thanks, Dave. Tremendous presentation. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. I think I missed something, though. You had a tremendous growth from about 2,000 plus to over 30,000. What was the impetus of that growth? Was it population growth, expanded service area, or what caused that growth? Dr. Reed, there's a business term called pent-up demand. Whoops. I would tie it to the business principle of pent-up demand. As I said, um, the region did not have access to a community college or workforce development. We opened our doors and students were lined up around buildings with their blankets and sleeping bags because for the first time they had an opportunity to go to college. So we, we're dealing with that pent up demand. We do have population growth, but we're also penetrating that group of, I can't go to college, it's not for me, I could never afford it. We are trying to make it very clear in our community that college is for everyone. You can and you should go to college and you should graduate from college. So all of that is part of our enrollment strategy. I don't have a question, but I have uh, a comment to follow up with this gentleman's comment he just made, and that is, this is a very impressive, impressive presentation, and uh, I thank you for it, for sharing your work. Uh, more importantly, I want to laud you and applaud you for a job well done. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I believe that's five o'clock and that concludes this presentation. Thank you for being here. If you'd like an emailed copy of this presentation, come on up, give me your email address, but this will be on the ATD website. And if you have questions, come on up, come and ask them.
I was going to come up, yeah. So. Nick? Nick? No. There, there is one question. There is, there is one question about dual. Yeah. 